Hello and welcome to our special Africa Month broadcast. I'm joined today in studio by Professor Patrick Lodge Otieno Lumumba. Professor, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. No, it's a pleasure. Yes. Now, Professor, I had the privilege of being part of your audience today at the lecture at WITS, where you spoke on militarization of democracies and uh, spaces of higher learning. For me, it seems that politics of identity are more pronounced today more than ever. You spoke of a coming of age, mm -hmm. the need to redefine our politics in Africa. Mm -hmm. Just elaborate on, on that position of the need to redefine politics. There is a sense in which politics is at the very heart of the lives of all societies, including Africans, whether it's social cohesion or the economy or the day-to-day -day activities of any society. And overall, it is clear that African politics has not served Africa well, not in the manner that was contemplated by the founding fathers. Of course, there are few good examples in Africa, but the overall verdict is that we are not moving in the right direction. It is against that background that I take the view that we've got to stop digging the hole and ask ourselves, where do we go from here? Are we conducting our politics in a manner that gives hope to our young men and women? Are we conducting our politics in a manner that gives Africa the pride of place at the table of human relations? Are we conducting our politics in a manner that catapults Africa into the higher orbit of economic development and social cohesion and are we conducting our politics in a manner that makes Africa punch at her weight, not below her weight? And how do we redefine politics? Is that we must tell our story. As I said during that conversation in the evening at the University of Wit Voters Rand, there is a sense in which many African countries, depending on who colonized the country, still instinctively looks to the colonial power, what I call the conceptual West. The conceptual West means the erstwhile European colonizing powers and the United States, Australia, and their acolytes in the Scandinavian countries who believe that they have a divine duty to tell us what to do. And African leaders also instinctively believe that they have a divine duty to accept to be told what to do. Hmm. And I'm saying that that is unacceptable. One billion people plus with a proud tradition must define themselves. And I'm not oblivious of the fact that when I talk about Africa, I'm not talking about a homogeneous society. I'm aware that even in South Africa, there are many nations. There's the Kosa, the Zulu, the Pedi. In Nigeria, there's the Yoruba, the Fulani Hausa, the Igbo, the Ibibio, the Ijo. In Kenya, there are the Kikuyu, the Kamba, the Luhia, Tanzania, the Sukuma, the Nyamwezi, and all those. But that notwithstanding, there is a thread that links us as Africans, and we find ourselves in the 55 odd nations. What can we do to make ourselves be respected? In a nutshell, I'm saying, let us do something about our politics. And what is politics meant to do? You know, I am an Afro optimist, but I've always found favor in the words of the American Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. that all men are born equal, that they are endowed by their creator with a certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our politics should make us know happiness in its totality, not momentary excitement, happiness. Happiness about our health systems, happiness about the quality of education, happiness about creating opportunities for young men and women to invent and to innovate, and those who don't want to invent and innovate to be in a position to be engaged in gainful employment. Happiness to help us to exploit our resources and to use them for the benefit of our people. And that requires selfless 
leadership. Mm -hmm. A long answer to a short question, but that it was, is what it deserved. A long answer so to a short question. But Professor, we seem to be in search of our identity as Africans, because today we speak of Kwame Nkrumah as being the greatest African that ever lived. At some point, he was vilified. Statues came, statues fell. Today, we want to erect statues of Kwame Nkrumah back again. It seems it's a return to ourselves. But really, have we not obliterated the legacies of the Julius Nereres, the Eduardo Montanis, that we cannot get to that point of return to ourselves? Can we really get there? Yes, we can, because what period of time are we talking about is not more than 60 plus years when we were in the 1960s obliterating the legacy of Sagye Fokwame Nukuruma or vilifying Modibo Keita or Ahmed Sekuture or Kaunda. Of course, Nyerere has always been in, in a different pantheon in terms of having not been vilified. Mm. But we now are able to realize that what these leaders could see in 1963 is what we think is something new. In other words, these were prophets without honor in their own homes. Ahead of their and time. Ahead of their times. If you look at even the most casual thoughts and works of people such as Nyerere Modibo, people such as Patrice Emery Lumumba, and, and, and many others, and even much more recently those of people like Chris Hani, or even Steve Bantu Biko, or even uh, Samora Moises Marshall, or Chisano, or Neto, Mandela. and Mandela, and, and, and even uh, uh, somebody like Andy Mbahaman Toivo Ya Toivo and Sam Nuyoma, you see that these were individuals who in many ways were dedicated not to the struggle, not for their own benefit, but largely to lift their people off the morass of economic want and social uh, disharmony and to put them on the firm ground of self-actualization and realization. And therefore, I personally hold the view that the verdict cannot be given now and that the realization that these individuals had an agenda which ought to be re-examined is, is in itself a good thing. And one can begin to see in quite a number of African countries that there is a return to those ideals. In fact, the whole agenda 2063 is informed by, by what one may call a Nukurumaist vision. Mm. Nukurumaist in the sense that when Nkosana uh, Lamini Zuma was the chair of the African Union, she wrote an imaginary letter to Nukuruma saying this is what your Africa will be 50 years from today. One can begin to see in countries such as Tanzania, the current president, John Pombe Magufuli, is actually revisiting some of the ideals of, of Malimu Kambarage Nyerere and his colleagues. And he's saying that the basis of politics must be the, basics, the basic of ideals and taboos. In other words, we must ask ourselves what is in the best interest of Tanzania and by extension Africa in the long term? And what are the taboos that we must not allow or to invade our affairs. Recently, when I saw President Ian Kama leave office because the Constitution says so, I was gladdened. Mm -hmm. When I saw Joachim Chisano doing the same, when I saw in, so in, in, in Namibia, Ifikepunye Pohamba do so, Even in I Ethiopia. was glad. Even Ethiopia, Haile mm. Deseleni, knew that there is a problem, the Amhara, the Oromo, the Antigrinya problem, and he left office and said, if the pacification and the accommodation of the majority is what is necessary for Ethiopia to remain Ethiopia, I'm prepared to sacrifice my political interest for the general good. That is what we need. Mm -hmm. And that is what I think Africa must press for. In other words, there is a sense in which we must now begin to have enlightened leadership. But enlightened leadership must also be supported by an enlightened electorate. Yes. Democracy, however defined, presupposes that the people know what they want and that they make demands of their leaders. And when they make those demands, it is the duty of leadership to offer guidance and to ensure that the general good is achieved through engagement. Because democracy 
is about participation. Mm -hmm. And Africans ought to participate from a standpoint of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of democracy, yes. if we go back to Kwame Nkrumah and yes. the vilification, yes. some said it was justified to a yes. certain extent. Yes. Because here we had a number of African leaders when they broke from colonial rule, they called for a one-party state. Mm -hmm. But what we have known to be democracy is that democracy exists within a multi-party state. You seem <laughs> to have agreed to a certain extent. I heard you today. Yeah. You said to a certain extent you agreed with Nkrumah on there, although, or at least you said you understood his position, yes. but not necessarily agreed. Correct. But that when Mabutu Sesseseko called for it, yes. then you didn't understand, <laughs> nor did and you I, agree. And, 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 and I agree with you in that assessment. Mm -hmm. Why did I understand Nkrumah? Why did I understand Nyerere? Why did I understand Kaunda? Why did I understand Kamuzubanda? Understand Modibo Keita? Understand Felix Ufebwanyi? Understand Leopold Sedar Senghor? Do you understand Ahmed Sekoture? It's because if you look at their thoughts at that time, Kwame was saying, we have just inherited a state which is essentially a neo-colonial state. The erstwhile colonial master is already engaged in subterranean shenanigans which are designed to torpedo our democratic enterprise. We are multi-ethnic societies. If we allow political parties to take root at this stage, they are not going to be political parties in the classical sense. But they are going to be ethnic enclaves and we are going to have conflicts on the basis of our ethnicity. Let us have one political arrangement movement under whose auspices we can agree and disagree in an agreeable manner, but we strengthen the state going forward. And when we have attained a certain level of maturity, then we can begin to free the political space. There are those who argue, but that did not justify detention of individuals without trial. And I agree. Mm. But remember that many of these individuals were thrown into the deep political end. And even as they governed, they were in a learning process. And of course, very quickly, the enemies of the continent of Africa seized that opportunity and on the excuse of restoring democracy, did in fact destroy whatever had been built and Africa has continued to pay a bitter price for it because of these individuals who ended up destroying institutions. People can now begin to see the wisdom of the Nukurumas because they are seeing that democracy must not be as defined by West, Western countries. Mm -hmm. It is Western countries in the post-Soviet era, in the era where we had, uh, after we had the, the, the bipolar world, where things are now cast from the moral and intellectual squint of the West. They tell us in order to have democracy, that democracy means, one, that you must have multiple political parties. It means, two, that you must have uh, free and fair periodic elections. Three, that you must have human rights which are without categorization, whether they are social or cultural, whether they are economic and political, whether they are development, but they are universal and indivisible. That you must have the separation of powers in the classical Western model, which we have the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. All these are good and they cannot be undermined or contradicted. But there is a sense in which, as one person said, that the English oak is an English oak. It grows with greater exuberance in England, but when it is exported to foreign lands, it must be pruned a little. So I too believe that democracy must be redefined to take care of some of the fundamentals and the realities of Africa. Let me give an example. In South Africa, you are a democratic since 1994, or you are moving in the direction of democracy. But because of the realities of South Africa, the king of the Zulu has a place in that democratic dispensation, and there is no contradiction. We have in Ghana, we have a democracy, and the king of the Ashante has a place in that dispensation. 
in Uganda. Some may argue that President Museveni has stayed for too long, but there is a sense in which there is some kind of freedom, some kind of democracy. But the king of the Baganda, the king of the Toro, and the king of the Basoga still have a place. In other words, there is no one size fits all in the manner that London, Washington, Paris, Brussels, Madrid, and Lisbon want to dictate to us. And why should they dictate to us? Who has given them this divine right that they can speak to us as cathedra, that this is what it is, and we have this duty to obey willy-nilly? I'm saying no. Time has come that if we are redefining things for ourselves, let the dictates come from Addis Ababa, from African Union, and if it is to be regionalized, let it come from SADC, ECOWAS, East African Community, the Maghreb, and Central Africa. Speaking of the African Union, yes. the Constitutive Act clearly defines how we should go about handling ourselves as Africa. But for some reason, we have never utilized this well-written Constitutive Act. You know, one of the things that worries me about Pan-Africa institutions is their weakness in action. We have the African Union, which, as you rightly say, you look at the Constitutive Act, it speaks things that are lovely. If we implemented only a third of them, Africa would be El Dorado, that fabled land of gold. If only the Pan-African Parliament, which sits here in Johannesburg or is here in South Africa, in Pretoria, were to do half of the things that they say, it would be a good thing. But the gap between implementation and pronouncements is so wide that sometimes the people don't even know that the African Union exists or that they have an agenda 2063. And one of the problems is that we don't have champions for the African agenda. I yes. hold the view that that is what we need. In the early days, you had true champions. You could mention names, and I've already had the occasion to mention them. People who traversed the continent of Africa and spoke with the zeal and zest of missionaries of old. Today, we have problems in places such as the Cameroons or Central African Republic or South Sudan. Mm. But we cannot hear the voices of these individuals. My prayer now that during this year, when you have President Paul Kagame of Rwanda being the chair for the one year that he will be, that we will see a lot more. And I've already seen certain examples. Recently, you remember, they met in Kigali, yes. and certain pronouncements were made. I was very happy, for example, to listen to President Cyril Ramaphosa proposing that we should have one currency. It's a pronouncement that plants a seed. I was very happy to see that we talked about the free trade area. I was very happy that we had something that deal with the open skies. Now we must cascade them to the regions. And once we have cascaded them to the regions, the regions must begin to implement them. And it's the duty of the media in Africa, for example. It is the duty of the academia in Africa. It is the duty of the African population to make demands of the leaders. I don't want to be stopped at the border in South Africa when yes. I'm going to another African country. I don't want visas to come to South Africa. I want to come to South Africa as if I'm visiting another province, as if I am moving from, from, from Limpopo or to, 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 to Cape. That is what I want, and mm -hmm. I look forward to those days so that my movement is as if Africa is one country. I look forward to those days. But, Professor, how do we get to that point when many of us know that power sustains itself through divisions, whether they be ethnic, linguistic, but perhaps that's how colonial power sustained itself. I mean, what happened in Rwanda? Many still talk of the Hutus and the Tutsis having fought, them, fought against each other, but really can we talk about the roles of the Belgians for entrenching that division there? Same thing in Sudan. When we talk about what happened in Darfur, colonizers are to blame, but easily we can say Africans will eat each other. Mm -hmm. Do you think that perhaps history or education can be used as a tool to redeem or return us to ourselves? First of all, let us ask ourselves what kind of education? 
Because I think education is at the very heart of what we are doing. And education must be understood in its totality, not simply going to school. I believe that school does help. But what are we teaching ourselves in these schools? And, and, and if you look at many countries which have realized their potential, even outside of Africa, you go to the Scandinavian countries of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, uh, Finland, and, and those countries, their education is geared to achieve a certain goal. If you look at uh, Southeast Asia, you look at China, you look at the Koreas, and more recently Vietnam and even Cambodia, you see that education is deliber deliberately designed to help them achieve a certain goal. You go to certain Arab countries, that is the same thing. Education is very important. But when you look at quite a number of African countries, we continue to immerse ourselves in the education that was put together by the white colonizers to make the African elite an appendage for white activities. We must liberate ourselves from that kind of education. In the words of Kenya's Ngugi Wa Thiongo, we must have education that decolonizes our minds. And I think that that can be done. One of the things that I'm beginning to see in Africa today is the movement towards the re-examination of the curriculum asking what kind of things are we teaching in the kindergarten, what kind of things are we teaching in primary schools, what are we teaching in high schools, and what therefore are we teaching in our universities. Once we have done that, I hold the view that we must now have leadership, because political leadership is the most visible. And leadership and statesmanship are two things apart. The politician, to use this statement that is made and is a cliche, the politician looks to the next election. The statesman looks to the next generation. Mm. This is the time that we must have statesmen. And I'm very happy that Cyril Ramaphosa, whom I've followed for quite some time, even during the apartheid era, is now the president. I hold the view that if he stays on a certain path, South Africa is big enough in terms of high economy to provide leadership in the southern part of Africa, and there are enough good leaders in this region. People like Hage Gengob in, 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 in Namibia, people uh, like uh, President Nusi down there, I think he is capable of being uh, moved into the right direction. In East Africa, people like John Pombe Magufuli, uh, Paul Kagame, uh, even somebody like Yoerika Guta Museveni, who has been there and I hope will be leaving sooner rather than later. In West Africa, people like Aku, uh, uh, Akufo Ado, they, they are men who, if you listen to them and they stayed the course, are capable of providing leadership. But it is important to point out this. Democracy requires eternal vigilance. And that is why some of us must continuously be on the rooftops, shouting to the political leadership, speaking to them truth, sometimes irritating them in order to energize them to move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. That is our role, to play the, John, the role of John the Baptist, speaking in the Agora and said, oh, leader, move in the right direction. You are but a servant of all of us. You are but a servant to leaders to ensure that we realize our potential. You are but a servant to deliver to us on health. You are but a servant to create an environment where we can innovate and invent. You are but a servant to ensure that all our historical burdens are removed, that you are but a servant to do that which is in our best interest then we will move. But Professor, do we really want to or have the appetite to remove our historical burdens? Because when we talk of trade, we as Africa have been reduced for the longest time to producers or exporters of primary goods. You spoke about this at length as well. We've got cocoa that we produce, but chocolate is in Switzerland. Mm. We've got gold. But we are not playing in that value-added space where there's real money as opposed to the raw materials. We're buying watches that come back so expensive, more expensive and worth more than what we exported. Is there an appetite for Africa to really create that manufacturing hub? If we don't have an appetite, we must, find and lo we must look and find appetizers. We have no choice. <laughs> the world is now so clear that the law of the jungle, whether you like it or not, is what 
defines economy and politics. Survival of the fittest and the dying of the least suitable. What you now have between Africa and China, for example, this is not trade. Trade is between equals. This is raid. So we must begin to ask ourselves, how do we engage China? And we can only engage China if we are strong. Swaziland cannot possibly engage China. Mm -hmm. Lesotho cannot engage China. Angola cannot engage China. But Sadak can engage China. Mm. Burundi cannot engage China. Rwanda cannot engage China. But East Africa community can engage China. Yet we have bilateral relations. You have Swaziland <laughs> meeting with the U.S. president, and they say these are bilateral no, no, conversations when they are not That equals. is a joke. The GDP of, 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 of Rwanda, or rather of Lesotho at best, is equivalent to the uh, personal earnings of Oprah Winfrey. So in my view, those bilaterals are a joke. What Burundi only makes sense in East Africa, in the context of East Africa. Lesotho and Swaziland only make sense in the context of SADC. And the sooner we realize that, the safer we are. Because if we don't, the reality of politics, which is real politic, is very harsh. That ultimately the yen will overtake the rand. The yen will overtake the Kwanzaa. The yen will overtake the Kwacha. The yen will overtake the Metical. And the sooner we realize that, the safer we are. And that is why this is urgent business. This is urgent business. And I look forward to the day that the AU will herself have a clear agenda. One of the things that is said in the seven pillars of Agenda 2063 is that we will eliminate the last vestiges of colonialism, that all the guns must be silent in the year 2020, that we will be a middle-level economy by the year 20, by, by in 50 years' time. This must not be platform positions which are not accompanied by real concrete action. This is what I would want discussed at the Pan-African Parliament. This is what I would want discussed at the regional parliaments and at the national parliaments. And if this is done, then Africa will begin to move in the right direction. And, and let me just conclude this limb of my answer by reminding us that there are now two strands of views about Africa. They are the Afro-pessimists who hold the view that Africa is dead on arrival, that Africa is going nowhere, that in fact they are writing her obituary. Some of them even boldly say that Africa ought to be recolonized. And they say they can't govern themselves. Look at what they are doing to themselves in South Sudan. Look mm. at what they are doing themselves to themselves in Congo. Look at what they are doing to themselves in Somalia. Look at what they are doing to themselves in the Cameroons, what they are doing to themselves in Mali. They should be recolonized. Then they are the Afro-optimists to which I belong. Mm -hmm. We, the Afro-optimists, believe that these are unfortunate hiccups and that Africa is beginning to realize that she must do the right things. And when I see certain activities in a number of countries, they are not dramatic, but they are things that are telling me that we can move in the right direction. When I see Angola, uh, Dos Santos leaving office, mm -hmm. when I see President Zuma leaving office, when I see Robert Gabriel Mugabe being removed from office in what is a coup that was never a coup, mm -hmm. when I see Ian Kama leaving, leaving office, when I see John Pombe Magufuli doing his thing in Tanzania, when I see President Akufo doing his thing in Ghana, when I see in Gambia Adama Baro when I see in Liberia George Opongwea coming into government, I say, yes, we are moving in some direction. We can never afford the luxury of giving up hope. There are those who think that Africa's problems will be in, solved through some big bang solution. It is going to be gradual. It is going to be painful. But who said it would be easy? But as Kwame Nukuruma said, let us look neither east no West, let us look forward and let us keep in motion. And I think it is Martin Luther King Jr. who put it more dramatically than I can ever master. He said, 
If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl, but keep on moving. Mm, powerful. But then what becomes the first agenda? African unity or being present at the dinner table of civilization, as you put it? You see, Africa must move in the direction of unity. And this unity, if you permit me this analogy, is like marriage. In the early days, if it is not an arranged marriage, the fire that keeps it burning is romantic love. But when you get into the deeper aspects of it, love changes and is a combination of tolerance and love. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that is the recipe. So African countries may not even understand nor like each other because of their tradition but they must recognize that their general and overall good demands that they move as a team. And therefore, when we go at the dinner table of civilization, we know that we have our domestic problems, but we are not just about to expose it to the outside world. To the outside world, we are united face, and when we have our quarrels, we quarrel in-house. That is what leadership is all about, selective memories doing that which is in the general overall good, we can achieve it. And if we can't, we must know that if we don't achieve it, we are endangered. And that danger should force us into a union. Mm. The question of land, Professor, in this country, if, if we had to bring it to South African politics, mm -hmm. there are some that put it, put it so eloquently and say that they joined the struggle for land and cattle. Democracy was the byproduct. They could take away democracy if they could get back their land at this point. Is that really a position to hold or we've got to look at it differently? When I was a student of law, I was taught by a professor, the late Heston Okothogendo, and he used to tell us very eloquently and passionately that land is the last colonial question. Land is the last colonial question. And he gave examples in Kenya, for example, the whites expropriated what were known as the White Islands. And when they were leaving the British government as an atonement for their many sins, did provide for acquisition based on compensation. And largely the land problem was resolved. The manner in which land was acquired in southern part of Africa was more pernicious in Zimbabwe, pernicious. In Namibia, pernicious. In South Africa, pernicious. But an outsider must be very slow to be prescriptive. But an outsider must notice that until, and un until the day you resolve the land question, whatever apparent peace you have and enjoy is deceptive. It is important that the current land owners or occupiers engage meaningfully with those who are rightly saying that they ought to have their land back. It is through such meaningful engagement that a result of, for implementation will be found and is the duty of the government of the day to be the midwives that creates a solution that ensures that the majority blacks have the larger portion of the land. It cannot be right. Mm -hmm. that a minority own over 80% of the land. It cannot be right, not in this God's earth, not in God's heaven. And how you do it is what is important. You must not do it with the rush that I saw in Zimbabwe. We must learn the mistakes that were made in Zimbabwe and not repeat them in South Africa and not repeat them in Namibia. And I believe... If you put many of the South African landowners on a table with the blacks, they will agree there was a historical injustice. What they may not agree on in fine details is how to repair. But if they negotiate in truth, an answer will be found. Mm -hmm. And but perhaps they had better be locked in a room until an answer that is acceptable to all sides is found. There seems to be many questions around the answer as to how yes, indeed. we return the land. The economic freedom fighters have been 
the strongest advocates of land expropriation without compensation. Uh, I'm sure you have seen in the media space, their leader has been at pains to explain that there would be no white counterparts driven to the sea. He has spoken of this happening orderly, but somehow, in my observation at the very least, it seems that that specific explanation gets lost in translation and we're still focused on expropriation without compensation. I don't know <laughs> even in the media space because I'm somebody that says, did we hear him explain? He says it will be done orderly. Nobody's going to be driven to see. We need to share. But, but it seems not many are willing to have that conversation and ask him to elaborate and say, let's talk about the how. You know, the Nobody's devil, entertaining. The devil is always in the detail. And the media, by its very nature, particularly media that is animated by Western style of reporting, is that they ask what makes a good copy, what is sensational. But the question of land is one that must be reported and dealt with without sensation. And I can't, you put it so very well that the answer gives birth to yet other questions. I hold the view that the land question must be dealt with in a very sober manner. I want to warn myself that I must not be a visitor who is quick to prescribe, and I'm therefore warned even as I give this answer. Uh, what I can say is that there is a problem. Number two, that that problem must be resolved. Number three, that it cannot be right that the minority have the majority of the land. Number four, that the white South Africans are also South Africans. They have made that decision, and they must be dealt with as white South Africans. Whether there should be compensation, even if it is market value, if it's not market value, that is for the South Africans themselves to determine. And when I hear Julius Malema, how I understand him is, he's saying there will be a process that process will have some pain. That process will pain, although it will be painful, it will not be of such a nature as to disenfranchise any South African, and that those South Africans will still have a pride of place within their nation, free in South Africa. And what one therefore wants to hear, and if one were to interview Julius Malema, who I think has been very articulate in my view and very passionate in mm. this regard, is to ask him, I'm sure I'm told you call him Juju. <laughs> ask him Juju. Now you've said it. Now give us in black and white. If you are the one who are told to deal with this land, Juju, tell us in fine detail, step by step, how would you go about it? And I'm sure uh, Com El Comandante, as you but call it, perhaps have nobody an wants to ask that question it out of fear asked. that he probably has a clear process, a clear plan. So is it perhaps oh, we that some don't be want afraid. to go there? Leadership is not about cowards. We cannot be afraid to ask the questions that need to be asked. Sometimes in order to solve societal problems, you ask questions that you never wanted to ask. You give solutions that you never wanted to give. And that is what leadership is all about, lonely. Mm -hmm. Leadership is about bravery, taking decisions that will be condemned now, but whose value will only be realized centuries to come. South Africa must confront that question. Namibia must confront that question. And I believe that many African countries must confront that question. And if the sooner they confront it, the safer. So we cannot continue to postpone these critical issues because they then remain some kind of volcanic lava waiting to burst out. Mm -hmm. And then when we talk macroeconomics, we cannot operate in a silo. In as much as we want to be independent, we need to exist in the world. How then do we manage, if we are a united Africa, how do we manage the trade beyond? if we talk of Agenda 2063? Let's look at it from two perspectives. One, if you look at the current level of intra-African trade, depending on who you are talking to, intra-African trade is not more than 20%. In other words, Africa does not trade with herself. If you go to Europe, inter-European trade is possibly at the level of 60%. If you go to Northern America between, uh, between the United States and Canada and the entire what used to be the NAFTA region is possibly 40%. You go to Asia is anything between 40 and 50%. The first thing that we must do 
is to ensure that we are trading amongst ourselves. How can it be, for example, that we have a shortage of maize in Kenya and there is a glut of maize in Malawi? How can it be, for example, that the cows that are being produced or the beef that is being produced in Botswana cannot get it to Kenya? How can it be that we have a shortage of uh, bananas in Uganda and there is an, a glut of production of plantains in, 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 in Ghana or that we have peanuts in Uganda and there are no peanuts in Mali? And that can only be achieved, number one, if we remove the tariff and non-tariff barriers. We must allow free movement of goods and we must also create peace because part of the problem in Africa is that there are so many conflicts in these borders that to move a truck from, uh, from Addis Ababa to Dakar will possibly take a month because you are going to meet Boko Haram, you are going to meet Al-Shabaab, you are going to meet several guerrilla movements. So we must silence the guns. Once we silence the guns, then people will be able to move freely. We must harmonize our tariffs and remove certain tariff barriers, we must begin to harmonize our laws. And I'm aware that within the Comesa region, the IGAD region, the SADAC region, the East African Community region, and the ECOWAS region, there are movements in that direction. Once we put the level of intra-African trade to anything between 50 and 60 percent in the next 10 years, then we will begin to compete. How? By a value addition. Today, if you look at cut diamond from Namibia, and I'm aware that the Namibians have now acquired some technology, there is a lot of work that is now being done in Windhoek, which is value addition. But still, there is a lot of control of this product in Antwerp. If you look at gold that is traded, I know that in Joburg, there perhaps is some uh, trade in the AJC, and that there is some trade in the Accra, but most of the gold is traded in London. And, 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 and the FTSE is what is the standard that we are using. And I'm saying that if we add value in that regard, we'll ensure that our coffee, our tea, and other things will regrow and regenerate our textile industry so that Africa does not become a, a dumping ground for clothes and jeans that have been worn and discarded by Europe and America. In other words, we can do this, and when, therefore, we admit things, we can tell the Chinese, don't send us toothpicks. We don't want our, your eggs. Our chicken know how to lay eggs. We don't want your fish. We can produce fish in our rivers. We don't want certain things because we can produce them. And you only bring us what we need. We can generate electricity. Because part of the problem we have in co is cost of production. Nigeria, for example, produces no more than 4,000 megawatts of power. Mm. Look at Iran, 65,000 megawatts of power. South Korea, 65,000 megawatts of power. Ethiopia now, I think, next to uh, Morocco has the highest generation. Ethiopia now does anything between 10,000 and 15,000 megawatts. Then you can begin to talk about industrialization. When we begin to do that, even the minerals in the Congo, like rare earth, which is found in every telephone, will now be used and Africa will begin to produce their own mobile. I love when you speak yeah. of Congo. Congo yes. has the most resources, but they cannot seem to get it right. What is wrong? <sighs> Congo, Congo. Congo is a sorry state. That unfortunate country, blessed in its mineral, blessed in our people, mm. but her leaders, whether it was Moise Chombe or Kasavubu or Mobutu or the two Kabilas, they have failed to realize that leadership is about servanthood, is about trusteeship. Mm. The net effect is Congo is the only country in the world that I know whose leader's term comes to an end and he says, we have no money to, to hold elections. Mm. That rich country. And my frustration is that the African Union should have moved into that country with the firmness that sees Joseph Kabila leave office. The African, whenever African Union or ECOWAS did that, ECOWAS has done that on two occasions. In the Gambia, they forced Yahya Jame out yes. of office. In Liberia, they put their foot down. So what I expect is that even SADAC, because Congo is in SADAC, that SADAC tells Kabila, you must leave office. We are not going to allow you to mess up a country. 
That's that is the of... kind of thing that you've seen even in Europe when there was the trouble in Kosovo and those areas. Europe said, not in our backyard. Africa must say, not in our backyard. Because if there are problems in Congo, you border nine other African countries, you are generating refugees and stressing our resources. And these are the kind of things that make one angry. One wants to be a chairman so of African Union and, and one wants to be a crusader. You cannot sit in the African Union like a bureaucrat, mm. for God's sake. You need a crusader who annoys and re irritates African leaders, even if they remove him after two days. You talk of silencing the guns. Yes. We report helplessly. People are dying in Africa. We report helplessly. And the AU does nothing. <sighs> Only yesterday, the day before, three days ago, I wrote a letter to the chairman of the AU, Dr. Mohamed Musa, and said, please send a fact-finding mission to southern Cameroon. Houses are being burnt. Women are being raped. People are not going to school. Call and convene a meeting of African heads of states of government as an urgent act. But somehow, maybe he's handicapped in some way. They are lethargic. Somehow, they cannot act. Somehow, they are untouched and unmoved. And letters such as ours perhaps are dismissed uh, as the frustrations of inconsequential individuals which time will render useless. It is sad. But yet we can never f not afford the luxury of giving up hope. Then meaning this project needs to be spearheaded by the proletariat, that if there's something to learn from the Arab Springs, is that when the proletariat, when you have the working class that is fed up, things will change. And in fact, the working class, not only the proletariat, even the middle class, if you look at what happened in Tahrir Square, it was not just the, the masses, it was the professionals, the doctors, the lawyers, the business people. They said, we are tired. They started in a most innocuous way in Tunisia, then they came to Egypt. That is what is going to happen. Young Africans are beginning to say, we have waited for too long. When you see Nigerians in different parts of the world, they are some of the most industrious people that I know. When you see Zimbabweans with 90% unemployment, when you see Eritreans, when you see all the Sudanese or the Malians or the Gambians going to Europe and America, it is not because they like it. If there were conditions that were suitable in Africa, they would struggle at home. Yes. But when you hear a young person say, he'd rather die at sea. At sea than to remain at home. That is not human. Mm. The human nature is self-preservation. When a human being says that, there must be something so grave at home, something so dehumanizing. That is what African leaders sometimes do not know. When I see them in limousines and in private jets, mm. with motorcades, I say, these men, not all of them. These men, who are they? Where did they come from? That they are so insensitive that they go to countries and receive 21 gun salutes and their people are dying at home. Hmm. Who are they? Are their hearts made of stone? Do they have eyes and they do not see ears and they do not hear? Are their consciences so seared? I ask, and many Africans ask even in their silence, but we cannot keep quiet. We must continue to raise our voices, talking not with the arrogance that will inflame their anger, but with the firmness and the clarity that will, will in the fullness of time, open their eyes. Mm -hmm. That is our patriotic duty. You talk of the optimists and the pessimists, yes. and then somewhere in between there, Yes. We have the comprador bourgeoisie. What do we do with these, this segment? You know, there is, you call them in the classical tradition of defining people as the comprador bourgeoisie. These are the people who lend themselves to being used by the erstwhile colonial power. Yes. We must liberate them from themselves. They are capable of being liberated.
Mm. They have such individuals that have very short term goals, the goal of self yes. gratification. They are the ones who actually destroy their countries through corruption. Are they not a bigger danger they are than big the danger. capitalists or the colonizers themselves because they are amongst us? Oh, the comrade of bourgeois has always been very dangerous because they are the ones who steal from Africa and they have no faith in Africa. They keep their loot in other parts of the world. And in other parts of the world, such individuals in China, whether they call them comrade de bourgeois or call them anything else, when they are caught, they are executed as an example to others. Hmm. There is no shortage of them. And somehow, this comrade de bourgeois, they have the uncanny habit into, of getting into public office. They are the ones whom we elect in many African countries. And once we elect mm -hmm. them, they think they are holding our brief, but they are holding their own brief and they are asking to be bought by any, any person point. who is in the political purchase market. My goodness. These are individuals who must be identified. I'm suggesting, therefore, that the African electorate must also be enlightened. African, the African electorate's affinity for thieves is mm. something that is scaring. We elect into office individuals whose only claim to fame is that they are thieves to use the words of Liberia's Boima Fanbule, they are still on an industrial scale. We must do that. Is it going to be easy? Perhaps not. Experience has shown that it's not easy. Must we give up? No, not at all. Must we speak about and against it? Yes, because history has also demonstrated that that which is clear must be repeated times without number so it becomes as clear as gold. Will it be achieved in like instant coffee? No. Therefore, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon race. Mm. It's not for the faint-hearted. Professor, yes. I could sit at your feet and listen to yes. you speak all day. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for yes. honoring us with your presence. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts, my hopes, and my frustrations. But I remain optimistic. And so do we. On that note, good night, South Africa.